response. So I get to have a rather unique perspective on these issues as I, I look at the, I look at systems from the view of the attacker, from the designer uh, meeting the system requirements needed to make a network actually work, and then also as a defender um, after things have gone wrong. So, um, and w at this talk, at these talks, I've seen a lot of discussion about um, individual tools, um, whether they be vulnerability assessment tools or um, protection tools, um, really interesting, neat talks. Um, my talk's gonna be a little different. My talk is about some of the fundamentals of architecture design, um, including, and then also getting the specifics about um, how to secure systems management protocols in an untrusted network within the DMZ. Um, I think that there needs to be uh, more focus in this area, and in particular in systems management and secure architecture design. Um, systems management protocols, at, as they've been developed throughout the years, have always been focused on the enterprise network as an internal entity. There hasn't been a really well-defined uh, thought about zones of trust when you're using enterprise-level system management protocols. As a result, oftentimes system management protocols turn your entire network into one big zone of trust. A lot of security requirements aren't built in. Um, you take a look at most system management protocols, they have um, some trivial authentication and, and some also some trivial access control, and that's about it. So what I wanna talk about today is um, implementing those system management protocols in an untrusted or semi-trusted network if you're concerned about security. I'm gonna outline some examples of some threats uh, that you'll see uh, in networks today, um, courtesy of Security Focus, and then um, go into some DMZ network architectures in the real world. Um, I'm gonna present you two core designs um, and then provide you with some advanced design issues uh, such as multi-segmentation in the DMZ, um, and dealing with partner and co-location DMZs, and then finally give you some hands-on um, uh, information on, on how to, to do system and network configuration for systems management. So, the threat is definitely out there. I mean, you take a look, for example, at SNMP. Uh, what the common running joke is, is that the acronym stands for security, not my problem, where you have um, world writable community strings, um, well-known community strings, usually private, which will actually allow you to reconfigure multiple devices. Um, not only that, but you've got, for example, buffer overflows on SNMP agents that will allow you to get complete control of the host. Um, sniffers, one of the most, what you would consider to be one of the most innocuous uh, applications possible. I mean, they're just sitting there passive, but actually Microsoft served, up us, served us up a network monitor full of buffer flow overflow vulnerabilities where a single bad packet can actually corrupt the entire network monitor process. But to be fair, Solaris and Snoop and also TCP dump also have the same problems. So it's not, not necessarily as simple as you think. Yeah. Remote control software, besides its intended functionality of providing console-like access when you're not at the console, um, you've got problems with weak authentication in VNC. You've got a s situation where, um, you know, in PC Anywhere, that if you send a malformed packet or a lot of packets to the listener service on PC Anywhere, it'll actually crash the whole box. This is not the way system management protocol should be behaving. Um, at, administrative interfaces over intended functional protocols. So you install a web server and guess what? It throws in an administrative servlet that allows you to have control of the, the, that application. Like for example, a layer called Fusion. So you got all these administrators who've locked down their boxes real well. You know, they've got you know, the firewall rule set up and they're only allowing port 80 in, but all of a sudden their cold Fusion servers are crashing left and right. And that's because if you went to the administrator page and typed in a password that was too long, it actually crashed, crashed the entire cold fusion instance. The administrators didn't even know it was there. The Cisco, uh, the well-publicized Cisco vulnerabilities, the 700 series uh, router uh, DOS and the six, uh, 675 web administration, we got routers that are running web servers for administrative interfaces. Um, and if you send a malformed URL 
to uh, Cisco 675, <laughs> it crashed the whole router. I mean, so you have to actually think about the, some of the administrative interfaces that are going on on your core architecture and component designs. You got threats at system logging. I mean, you've got your common attacks of, you know, log floating, log erasing, selective log editing, and the like. But not only that, as script kitties love to do, there's an actual denial of service vulnerability on Linux, on an older version of Sys, Linux syslog D. Uh, again, uh, unintended behavior for system management. Um, one of my favorites was if you wanted to crash a Solaris 2.4 2 box, send it a syslog message with an IP address that doesn't reverse lookup. It actually crashes the entire syslog process. Again, not intended functionality. Uh, you got backup software. You always have the common problem of uh, unauthorized restore and delete. You've got unencrypted backups um, that are walking out the door uh, with the crown jewels. You've got, and then you've got the backup agents themselves. I mean, Veritas backup agent has a denial of service vulnerability that'll allow you to bring the whole host to its knees. So, I've probably got some firewall administrators here. Some network administrators saying, ah, that's no problem. I've got my, I've got my routers tightened down. I got my firewalls set up right, so no system management protocols are going through. I mean, heck, I'm not allowing people to connect to my backup agent over the internet. Well, it's not enough. And uh, you want two words for why it's not enough? Aggravated penetration. So if I'm able to get into a single box in your network at a low privilege level, for example, the IIS uh, Unicode exploit, where I break in and have a low amount of privilege, and then from there can send SNMP commands to another host to reconfigure your router to open up those 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 tight and tightened firewall rule sets that you have, then the game's kind of over. Privilege escalation, you know, using buffer overflows and system administration and system uh, management uh, daemons um, once you have a single uh, level of privilege to escalate to another. And then of course, the all common insider attack. A lot of DMZs that I see are, are uh, very hard on the outside, but actually allow uh, end users in the internal corporate network to connect to the DMZ uh, to the back end. Um, and those system management protocols are wide open. So DMZ hosts are bastion hosts and perimeter services hosts. And I want to kind of have you have this question in your mind the entire time of why do we spend all this time hardening our DNS servers, always making sure that we have the right bind patch, and then we leave a poor password on the SSH service that's bound to an untrusted interface. It's a, it's kind of putting our priorities uh, in, a, in the wrong place. The DMZ exists to mitigate risk by isolating certain services and functions in a separate segment of the network. Segmentation by isolation is generally not enough. If I do ingress filtering, which is typical, I have a nice crunchy outside layer, but then I don't have the soft, I still have the soft inside layer. I need to have defense in depth. I can't just assume that once um, I'm protected from the outside world that that's enough. So I, I need to make sure that my in ho internal hosts have the same level of security. So I want to give you an example. This is a common uh, DMZ configuration that you see out there today. You've got, um, you got your uh, internet connectivity with a, a border router and firewall going in through these bastion hosts, um, DNS server, web server, FTP server, mail server. Um, going to an internal perimeter uh, choke uh, router firewall into an internal network. So this is um, a, this is one type of DMZ uh, where you'll see bastion hosts. Another type of DMZ that you'll see, uh, this is our tr another one, it's where you have dual home bastion host. In other words, one, two, two network interfaces, one on the front end and one on the back end. You might be using uh, outside public addressing, you might not even be using uh, NAT or anything like that at this, this pr uh, perimeter firewall. And then you've used, you're tr traditionally using internal IP IP addressing on the back end so that uh, perhaps you only bind SSH, like for example, to the internal interfaces and only the intended functionality of the untrusted protocols on the um, outside interfaces. Unfortunately, when you have this type of dual-homed design, 
Of, oftentimes the interior router will directly connect to the outside router so that traffic doesn't have to f flow through the bastion host. Um, I marked red as untrusted, green as, uh, uh, as trusted, and as you can see, I've kind of slashed this as both trusted slash untrusted. You gotta make sure that you have the right level of, of permissions at both of these interfaces to protect against attacks from the internal network by bypassing the DMZ altogether. You often, uh, you oftentimes see perimeter service hosts in a flat network. And I don't know how many security firewall vendors I see, well, I'll name a few, Cisco, NetScreen, Nokia with the Checkpoint Appliance, where they have a three port firewall. They've got your outside interface, your inside interface, and your DMZ interface. What, I think that's a horrible, horrible design, and it actually promotes bad design. So what you've got here is you've got a single device that is responsible for protecting your inside network from the, from the uh, internet, as well as you've got a DMZ segment here in the pseudo untrusted, semi-trusted land. And guess what? How are you going to administer these boxes? Well, you got to allow system management protocols through through these internal hosts through the same router and firewall that's used, that you're using to also connect to the internet. I often see this deployment in uh, smaller mom and pop or medium to small businesses where they don't have uh, the, the money to spend on two routers or to put uh, dual homed hosts in. Um, unfortunately, security vendors love selling the DMZ port because it makes them look like they're actually being flexible when actually they're giving you a poor security uh, uh, posture by this type of deployment. But if only if DMZs are that simple. You're probably looking at these diagrams saying, well, you know, this, this guy has never seen a real production network. Actually, I have. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll see is um, you've got a situation where security consultant geeks and wonks like me go in and you do an audit of your network and we go, Oh man, you know, you got your database server sitting next to your web server, sitting next to your app server. You know, you gotta have defense in depth. You gotta segment those suckers, you gotta, you know, separate them, you gotta put separate router ACLs and compartmentalize everything. And the system administrator is sitting on the other side of the table going, oh man. So that means I gotta put in more routers, I gotta deal with more routed tables, I gotta worry about the performance of the backups over the routers. So, you know. How do you administer these boxes then? Like, let's say I've got um, you know, my, my web server and my app server sitting here on the front end, and I've got my database server and my app server on a separate segment, and I want to admin the, the web server from the internal network. I gotta pass you through, to, through two firewalls and two firewall rule sets to get out to that, um, to that uh, web server interface, which requires a lot of rule management. And sometimes you'll even see a bypass, like for example, in t traditional deployments, I'll see, well, we segmented some of it over here, but whoops, I got the mail server, it's gotta connect right through. So, you know, it's a difficult situation. But it gets even more complicated. Uh, after segmented DMZs, you got co-located DMZs, where you've got, for example, a, a corporation who has part of its corporate presence, you know, right here down at the bottom, where, yeah, my pointer is acting flaky. So you got the, the the corporate facility where they have the corporate services on the DMC. For example, the mail and proxy servers out there. And then you've got um, you maybe your production e-commerce site up there on uh, on the top, where you, you might have a web server and an application server and a database server on the back end. So oftentimes, what you'll see is at the perimeter. Uh, at the, excuse me, at the back end routers and firewalls, you'll actually see either a point to point or VPN connection be between them. So like say I'm a system administrator over here in the internal network, what I'll do is I'll actually connect in um, via SSH maybe to a management host over here where I can administer all of these boxes. So that this presents interesting challenges for the system administrator. Then we've got partner DMZs, uh, where you have mutually semi-trusting and or distrusting parties. So let's say company A wants to provide a, uh, a company A and company B get together and decide they want to provide a, a joint service to the internet. So let's say corporation A has a maybe a database server here and corporate, corporation B has an XML feed and then you've got a web server sitting over here that presents them into a unified front. Well, it's all good good and well once you've gotten to this point, but how do you administer the web servers in a mutually distrustful uh, DMZ? This may be co-located in 
a you know in Corporation A's website uh, web farm, or it might be in Corporation B's co-location facility. But you also have to worry about in here, especially in this DMC, making sure that Corporation A doesn't attack Corporation B uh, to get a leg up or get advantages. So you've got all kinds of problems in, in the DMZ. You've got other problems, constant change. I mean, you've got the marketing department that tomorrow needs to promise to all these partners that they would get these, uh, you know, this, this marketing website up so that they can send uh, new graphics and, and, and new pyramid schemes to all their customers. And, you know, don't worry, they've built the host, you know, they'll just throw it on the network. Just give me an IP address and I'm good to go. Well, too many hands in the pot. You've got sy systems uh, management protocols and service protocols that are not designed with security in mind. Here's one of my other pet peeves, is, is you've got scalability mechanisms of which create an additional uh, separation and obfuscation of a clean network design. Load balancers are a horrific violator of this. So you've got uh, load balancers that are, are you're connecting in at level two um, of stack um, that are using a single VIP uh, virtual IP address to present um, a web server or the like. And imagine that you have that configured without a dual home host at the back end. You've gotta make sure that you're addressing the individual IP address um, when you're trying to do system management of, of those hosts that are behind that VIP, rather than addressing the VIP itself. If you address the VIP itself, you're playing, you're playing craps about which machine you're actually uh, trying to administer. In addition, you've got co-location, uh, excuse me, you've got collusion of disparate types of traffic going through the DMZ. Um, the DMZ should be s as simple as possible. There's no reason that I should have an SSH session flying next to a customer web ses session, flying next to a backup session, next to an SNMP trap, all on the same wire. It's the risk management has broken down if that's the case. So I don't know if you've ever seen those cop shows where they show the, the guys uh, being hauled off in the back of the police car, um, and, you know, you kind of blur out their faces, um, or, or you draw a composite sketch of a, a expected of offender. Um, and this is my kind of composite sketch of the status quo of DMZs today, and this is a pretty common study from what I've seen. Um, you see no centralized login. You see SSH inbound from the internal network and often from the external network as well, so the system administrator doesn't have to drive into the, uh, drive into the corporate uh, facility at 3 a.m. when the servers crashed. Um, you've got PC Anywhere, VNC, SMS, accessible from management hosts or worse, just the entire internal network. You've got back in, backup systems that are either non-existent because heck, the DMZ network hosts are expendable, right? Um, or you've got backups batch copied to internal hosts because the, all the backup software is running on the enterprise network that the guys set up you know, before we even had a DMZ. Well, wait a second, there's something wrong here if your untrusted, seg untrusted hosts are actually making internal connections to trusted hosts in order to upload data. You've got a problem there. You've got default administrative protocols and interfaces left accessible within the DMZ and from the internal network. You've got SNMP running on routers, you've got web interfaces running on servers, and uh, thanks to Cisco and Microsoft, you can actually switch those around and actually have web interfaces running on routers and SNMP running on servers. You've got open view or other mo enterprise monitoring systems pinging and getting SNMP data from the, out from the inside. So securing system management components requires a combination of network architecture and system configuration in order to actually achieve these values. So what I'm going to present to you as two core designs. The first is a combination of management and production tra traffic on the same untrusted segment. So let me walk through this slide. So you've got the internet here, um, where you've got your intended production traffic up, up top here, and they're going in um, and connecting fine. And then, you know, some joker's trying to send SNMP traps to your web server or your uh, SSH, and you can see a firewall burning up the protocols right over here, and you see it exploding. Um, then you've got your router and your firewall, perhaps sending syslog messages to your log host over here. Um, same with the web server. You've got your inbound um, web traffic, your production web traffic, your inbound SSH coming from, let's say, a management station. 
that allows you to do SSH to the internal host. You've got uh, mail, mail servers that are uh, d using its intended functionality, as well as perhaps receiving SNMP queries from an SNMP monitor. Um, you've got a choke router and firewall here that allows system management protocols but denies everything else. So, you know, if, so, if for some reason the mail server is misconfigured and tries to send a DNS packet to the log host, you know, the, the fire router firewall knocks that out. So this is a pretty typical configuration of where you actually have um, the management and production traffic shared on the same untrusted segment. Now, and I'm going to define the untrusted segment as where a, an untrusted user or process can place packets on the segment. So in the, there's an important distinction there, actually. I mean, users are, uh, that's a pretty simple thing to define. You know, you've got somebody initiating a web server connection to your, to your GMZ host, but then you've also got untrusted processes such as uh, XML feeds or uh, database, um, uh, database queries that are running from, um, as a result, of untrusted uh, user input. There's some advantages to this design. Um, it's simple to manage. You don't have to deal with multiple interfaces. And your firewall rule sets are, are easier uh, to, uh, to manage under this situation. I mean, you've just got two things to administer. Um, you've got and it looks relatively segmented. But there's problems. Um, there's the problem, first of all, of bandwidth utilization. So what happens when I've got, like, for example, a backup host connected to this system administration network, and I want to run a backup of the web server every night, and at the same time, the web server needs to talk to the mail server um, for production-oriented traffic. You often have battles of your production traffic versus your um, systems management traffic. You also fail to segment different types of traffic introduces security risk. So as a result, um, for services that re require to you to listen to input, you've actually got to configure, like for example, the web server, okay, I'm going to have to listen to um, SSH coming from certain hosts, but not other hosts. Um, unfortunately, and, and compared to if you block it off at the, se at the network segment level. It's harder to monitor for policy violations because, for example, let's say you know you do actually run some web system, uh, web-oriented system administration. It's going to be very hard for you to distinguish it with your IDS or your other um, session monitoring tools. What is an administrative web connection versus what is a production-oriented end-user untrusted connection? Um, the untrusted segment behind the firewall will advertise management services, and as a result, the uh, compromised host uh, on the segment can spoof or just plain initiate a management connection. So I present to you a second solution, and this is a separate management LAN. So under this situation, you've got dual homed hosts, and this is a relatively simple one. So you've got web, a web server, um, and DNS server, and a mail server. Uh, you've got untrusted interfaces sitting on the front end. You've got um, entrusted interfaces sitting on the back. Um, you've got some other services running here. You've got, for example, um, and maybe an SSH gateway that you can connect to from your internal network that allows you to connect to, you have to connect to this, and this is a hardened, well-monitored host that allows you to SSH to the mail server, um, the web server, and the like. You could have a log host sitting on the management LAN that can be connected maybe to an out-of-band system, like a pager, a pager gateway or the like. Um, to like running swatch to monitor um, process violations. And if you're really paranoid, you could set a serial cable set up to the, to the log host uh, to, to a PC that's not connected to the network at all to do dumb logging. And then you could have, for example, a console server, which you could never do. You could never put this console server, for example, on an untrusted segment, no matter how good your router and firewall uh, configuration is, because you're actually connecting to the hard console, maybe your router, um, maybe your web server, so if the machine, if these machines crash in a hard way and the SSH daemon dies, you don't actually have to go to the co-location facility to, uh, to reboot the host. Um, so this protects bandwidth on the untrusted network segment and reduces another hurdle for intruders to jump interfaces, which can be locked down more aggressively. You're able to monitor uh, your, your violations uh, within a segment much easier because you'll be able to say, okay, the only types of CGI access I should see on this segment is the ones that I've intended my, uh, my production users to use, and the only type of web traffic that I should see on this segment is, for example, cold fusion web administration tools, for example. A lot easier breakdown. 
Um, you can place log hosts, monitoring hosts, and control components in the management LAN with less risk and also reducing your reliance on the internal network. It also allows for more flexibility with private address space and less border firewall concerns. You don't even have to run NAT on this router and firewall if you don't want to and deal with all the headaches that, that NAT gives you if you're using if you're if you're using bash and host with a management LAN. Whoops. There are some disadvantages. You need to make sure that forwarding is disabled um, on the dual homed host. Um, this is one of the major complaints that I hear about uh, using a dual homed host with management land is that I can't get the packets to go where they need to go. And, and the, the thing that you need to make sure that you're doing is actually configuring your routing correctly on each host so that um, that you don't send packets where you don't mean to. So make sure your default gateways are set to the internal inter and the internal router, not the external router, um, and make sure that you have the fine static route for your hosts. Um, management lands can still be used as a conduit to attack hosts if not properly or secure secured and monitored. However, guess what? You're going to be able to monitor these segments a lot easier and have a lot more expected tra expected traffic analysis because you've properly segmented and defined your network. It also adds complexity to segmented DMZs and a potential bypass mechanism between segments. So if you go back to my issue of the segmented DMZ where you have multiple segments, if you don't design your management land properly, you can actually use it to drop um, from one um, exterior uh, untrusted host all the way to the interior of the network. I'll, I'll, call, I'll give an example of that here. So this is kind of um, kind of my Uber slide here. This has a lot of things going on and I'll, I'll walk through it. You've got connections to the internet. So this is what you would see this is getting closer to a real production network. You've got maybe a corporate, internal corporate network over here, and you've got a production network um, over here. So maybe this is a book selling company, and they're, you know, they've got their router and firewall over here c protecting their internal corporate network. Um, maybe they've got an IDS deployment where they have a promiscuous um, host running IDS that goes to a back end IDS master here. They've got um, their production web traffic that goes to their web server or their production mail, FTP. They've got um, a back-end management land here, all aggregating to a monitor or syslog host here. So you've got a web, web server, FTP server, and a production mail server, all sending syslog and maybe SNMP traps um, right to this box. And if there's an emergency, then it connects to an out-of-band pager network right away so that you don't have to wait for uh, further aggregation for systems that are, are failing. Then you've got an internal management LAN where you've got, for example, an application server with a monitor syslog box sitting next to it because you've already got a, a zone of trust here and you've got some choke points here, so you may be able to get away with putting your monitor and syslog box in the same segment as your application server because you're, this is a, should be a trusted segment because it's already going through three choke points, the router firewall, the bastion host, and another router and firewall. You've got your uh, database server on another segment so that you can properly uh, segment the traffic between your application server and your database server. Maybe you've got your backup system running right next to your database server so that the backups run smoothly and quickly. And you've got another aggregator for your uh, monitor and syslog here. Then you've got your back-end master uh, management network where you have a monitor master that's pulling all of from all of these monitor boxes um, and aggregating performing um, analysis uh, such as um, SNMP aggregation, uh, syslog aggregation, uh, running process monitoring, looking for odd things in the logs. You got maybe an IDS master here. And then you've got to do, you got to do system administration. So let's say you've defined an SSH gateway that you can use to connect to from the internal corporate network. And now this would usually be a private line, you know, a private T1 um, frame read a uh, VPN or maybe a VPN connection going to the SSH gateway, which then allows you system administrators to SSH to the back end interfaces of these to control these hosts. So that's that, this is kind of my Uber slide where you'll see 
what I'm trying to get at on this point is, is that if you aggregate, aggregate your management connections um, based on the natural segregation of the DM, segmented DMC, that you'll actually reduce your management land bandwidth, you'll have all the advantages of segmented DMCs um, so that you don't have to worry about bypass mechanisms. Um, like for example, if someone cracks your web server and then connects to the management land interface of that web server and goes straight to your database server when the normal, um, the production traffic firewall rule sets would not allow that. Um, you've got disadvantages. You've got um, more uh, equipment and more routes to maintain. You've got to maintain ACLs and rule sets between the management land. You've got additional points of failure. And you've got all the disadvantages of segment and TMCs that, is, and that they're typically hard to administer. Yes? Um, well, oftentimes what I see, and this is um, not necessarily a recommended practice, but I wanted to try and capture what, what often happens, is you'll see a private connection between the um, internal router and firewalls um, and the production router and firewall as for load balancing mechanisms or to keep production, uh, corporate traffic that needs to connect to the production network um, off out of the internet and only across the perimeter routers instead so that I don't have to go all the way over to the internet to connect to the untrusted interfaces of, for example, my production web server from the corporate network. <coughs> yes? Oh, well, this actually works rather well. Um, since you have, except for your most perimeter firewalls uh, and routers, um, which should be configured by console only, um, the, the, your other routers and firewalls should, should, would be connected to the management LAN, and therefore you could safely have a TFTP server implementation, um, of course, with the appropriate ACLs and uh, limitations of, on the, the routers and firewalls. So one of the other design issues that you got to think about, and you probably heard me allude to it earlier, is, is with the backup system, is pushing versus pulling data. So, you know, you've got zones of trust here. You've got your, this is the most untrusted area right over here. This is getting more trusted. And then once you're in this zone, this is extremely trusted. And you want to make sure that traffic flows from the untrusted, from the trusted side out to the untrusted, and that untrusted hosts are making connections or pulling or pushing data in to more trusted zones. So you, if you push data from the internal network to the DMZ admin land, that's good. But still, make sure that you've put in the appropriate um, limitations to make sure your internal users aren't using it as well if you're, they're not system administrators. Um, DMZ admin land pulling data from the internal network is bad. What I often see is someone popping a file over on the uh, internal corporate network as a batch job and then having the database server go over there and suck it out of the internal corporate network at midnight every night. That's a really bad design because then traditionally your internal corporate network should be your most trusted network. Um, or at least from the outside world. Who knows what your users are doing. But the, then you've got, you also need to, when you do have to push data, you should consider what the degrees of push are, because there are different degrees. You can do file and data transfer one way with or without validation. So for example, an anonymous FTP connection or a scripted FTP connection um, is, a, is a limited, very limited push versus an interactive transfer with restricted privilege where you actually have to have people, um, you know, FTP to host um, or Telnet to host um, under a restricted shell, for example. Or then, of course, remote control administration with full interactivity where you have SSH root shells. Obviously, that's the ultimate push. So you should always try and deploy the least amount of push possible. Ask your developers, can you do this just with a single file upload where you don't need you know, a, a knock person to actually physically move the file over? You know, try and limit the amount of exposure that you have there. So you want to use the minimum amount of push whenever possible. When DMZ host needs to push data to, for administrative purposes, aggregate and aggregate in the same trust boundary and then pull from the more trusted environment. So what we have here, for example, is we have a monitor syslog box that's, that's aggregating all my logs here and then the monitor master goes in and pulls that rather than 
the monitor and syslog box pushing. Um, so it'll be much harder for attackers to corrupt your master uh, uh, log system because they're not allowed to initiate connection. They're only allowed to have connections initiated to them. Never have DMC hosts pull or push from the internet without the appropriate risk analysis and mitigation. Antivirus vendors are a big abuser of this. Um, I see secure mail gateways that actually go to the internet every weekend and download a new virus signature, upload um, and deploy new executable code on the mail servers without a system administrator ever checking it to make sure they even work, let alone whether it's secure. Um, this is horrible, horrible design. Um, system administrators must check these types of things because, I mean, vi virus protect, if you spent all that money to actually build a virus content protection server and then you're allowing it to update itself arbitrarily and at w on its own, <laughs> you're out of luck. And what made my hair fall out is there's certain IDS vendors, <laughs> I won't mention any, any names, um, but they actually, some of them are actually allowing you to update your IDS signatures over the internet um, automatically uh, in a pool mechanism. Again, not something that's recommended. You need to take a look at what those changes are and not have them run lights out. So, we've gone over some network designs. I, at this point, I hope you have some ideas about um, how to maintain secure DMZ architectures and some of the system management challenges that go, come along with those network architectures. So now I want to talk about, with the time that I have left, um, to talk about four major areas of system management and give some concrete recommendations um, for backup, diagnostic, and availability monitoring, remote administration, and system logging. So let's start with backup solutions. There's a lot of risks that are present when you run backups. There's a bandwidth utilization. I've seen a lot of system administrators pulling their hair out because at, at midnight the whole network grinds to a halt as the, as the backups start to kick off. Um, you've got unauthorized restore and backups. I've seen really complex ACLs put on individual files in, on a DMZ host, and then an intruder tries to get the file. Says, darn it, I can't get to this darn file. Oh, wait, I can run the backup program and get a restore of that file that I want and throw it in the temp directory where I have access. Oops. Um, you got capture of backup traffic, which as an obvious thing, and thanks to uh, people like Doug Song and uh, his file snarf program, make it even easier. Um, the uh, you have agent vulnerabilities such as authentication. Um, you know that most backup agents, commercial software backup agents, will allow any backup server to connect to them and to start initiating data connections. Um, you got procedures for restore offsite that you have to deal with. I mean, uh, who do you trust with your tapes if you store them offsite? Are they just being thrown in your CIO's uh, 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 kitchen drawer or are they actually being maintained by uh, uh, licensed couriers um, who properly sign in and sign out every tape? And do you check them? Uh, the and of course, what I see oftentimes in the DMZ, especially for companies that are growing, is they just throw tape drives on every DMZ host so they don't even have to worry about, about that. Um, unfortunately, local backup devices on each DMZ host are often difficult to scale, and guess what? You've got a tape management headache of trying to maintain and catalog every tape that's, that's, um, that's being used by the DM, in the DMZ. So I've, I've gone, if you go to an Exodus or a, a BoveNet, go, go and walk around the cages and see how many tape drives are sitting there with this tape spilling out of them and you know and how you could easily just grab a broom ha handle and whack uh, one of those tapes over across the floor under the cage and, and you got the crown jewels. Backup clients are not necessarily designed with security in mind. I'm going to I'm going to uh, talk about that in a little more detail in the next in the next slide after this one. So if you're going to um, secure backup solutions, you have to protect the backup server at all costs. You should definitely place it behind another firewall or a filter, and the backup server should initiate all backup and restore requests to eliminate inbound connections. You should never allow your backup agent software to initiate restores. 
If you do that, then if the, back, if, the, if the system is compromised, the attacker can do it just as well as a system administrator. So you have to allow only restores to be pushed from the more trusted backup server to the to to the, the agents that are actually getting the files restored. You also need to consider the physical security of the server and the media, again, my co-location uh, cage example, and implement tight security controls on the server. Then one, one thing that you'll see oftentimes with um, system auditors or um, security consultants is say, well, do you encrypt your backups? And they arch an eyebrow, knowing that they'll at least have something to write about. Um, but actually, there's risk and benefits. It's not an easy check box type of thing. Um, it's not, you need to ask yourself, well, is the wire insecure? Um, you know, if the wire is insecure and I'm running backups over that wire, you know, I've got a lot bigger problems than whether or not my backups are encrypted. I gotta w wonder why that, that wire is unsecure in the first place. And if so, the client's got the bur burden of encrypting the data, which is often slows down backups dramatically. Um, you have to store the data uh, encrypted. Do you store it? And encrypted or not. Um, if the, if, how's key management performed? What happens if the key is lost? I've, I've been in un very unfortunate and sad situations where I've seen system administrator teams that have a backup server where they store all the keys to the backups tapes on the backup server. And guess what? The backup server fails. Uh-oh, out of luck. Um, and so, um, also, do you encrypt both the on-site and the off-site media? I would argue that you maybe don't need to think about encrypting the on-site media because you've got physical security mechanisms that should hopefully mitigate that risk. But on the off-site, I mean, do you trust the courier to make sure that he doesn't make a pit stop at Burger King on the way back to the vault and someone breaks into his car? I, I just don't think it's a, I think it's something you need to think about. So the administrative LAN segment is very beneficial for backup solutions. Also, you might want to consider using a storage area network, um, which often use backup solutions that aren't even run over the, 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 the traditional LAN at all. Um, I'm going to give an example of just one hard to, to secure product, and this is a Legato. Um, however, Veritas and Seagate and all the other ones have the same problem, but if I spent uh, the, my entire talk bashing on, on backup solutions, we'd never get out of here. Um, the server uses default ports of over a 2,000 port range in both UDP and TCP. The client uses over 20,000 ports um, over TCP and UDP. Boy. I f feel sorry for that firewall administrator. Guess what, it runs its own port mapper. And I'm sure that's been heavily security audited, just like the Sun uh, RPC ha uh, port mapper has. You can restrict the ports that it runs on, but guess what, if you restrict it to one port, you can only run one backup at a time. If you can restrict it to two, you can run two. So how lucky do you feel? Um, you've got um, authentication client between the client and the server unclear, as I brought what about before. A Legato server, you can't just arbitrarily connect to a Legato server. Uh, you have to have a username and password and everything's cool. But the server connecting to the client actually goes through no authentication mechanism whatsoever. NAT is not supported at all. In, in, in Legato, and it's in, it, unable to determine what interface it listens on. One of the problems that I often see, and you'll see this in other, other protocols, is that um, system management binds to everything. So if I got a dual home host, I've got my backup software binding to an untrusted segment. Well, my firewall rule set prevents me from, you know, from outsiders connecting to it, but that's not secure. Because if, if I'm able to compromise another host on that segment, well, then I've got a backup ser server that's listening on an untrusted interface that I can quickly connect to. So let's talk about monitoring solutions. So we've got SNMP. Let me just say a few things about SNMP. Just assume that anything that's sent over SNMP is readable by all. That doesn't matter whether it's V1 V or V2, it doesn't matter. Community string should obviously be changed from, from the traditional public and private, and if possible, you should limit the host that can query SNMP on the query device itself. Uh, Cisco routers, you can actually say which, what machine should be sending in SNMP queries. You should also examine the type of information that your device gives you via SNMP. You might think that it just sometimes just gives you, you know, whether I'm up or I'm down, um, whether I've got, what's my CPU utilization, what's my memory, and that's about it. 
but actually, for example, one of the things that have caused um, NT administrators to stay awake at nights is actually at the SNMP library for the Microsoft uh, Windows NT, um, actually, well, you can query it for shares, you can query it for usernames, groups, and all kinds of other things um, that you wouldn't normally expect to see over SNMP. Now, you can manually unregister parts of those in the, D, uh, in, the, in, the, in the system, but guess what? That configuration is not supported by Microsoft. Um, you can determine the criticality of the information, uh, whether or not to use SNMP. Um, so, you know, if you've got a device that has a relatively um, sane MIB uh, base that isn't going to give away the farm with a one rogue query, then eh, maybe it's okay to run it. You should never, however, allow reconfiguration of devices via SNMP. You should disable write privileges on any SNMP device. Traps should be used sparingly, and there should be a dedicated receiver on the DMZ. You shouldn't be broadcasting traps to an internal network, or you have to allow SNMP from the outside um, DMZ. DMZ into your internal network where you have an open view receiver. Install the open view receiver in the DMZ. Unfortunately, oftentimes SNMP is the lesser of another evil. You know what that other evil is? Vendor proprietary management extensions, specialized daemons that run that give you status of, of the services. Those are oftentimes even worse. At least people have been looking at SNMP. The ICMP, you know, there's, you know, that's a pretty common, oh, sorry. What about just the uh, version three? Um, again, uh, some of the uh, authentication mechanisms are, um, are, are promising, um, but again, I would go to taking a look at what the devices are, are giving up over SNMP and automatically just assume that anything that's going over SNMP is readable by all. I'm not, I shouldn't, I guess I should say that I'm not bashing SNMP. It's a great monitoring tool and a good way for, for example, having network operation centers be able to give network administrators and system administrators um, useful information when troubleshooting at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, that, you know, the CPU load has gone up to 100 or the disk you know, has failed. It's it's very, it's, it's very useful. You just have to balance and perform proper risk mitigation. The ICMP is another one where you have to do that. Um, you know, you have echo reply and request, which is usually fine on an internal interface, but you should be able to throttle your ICMP response queue. Um, so, for example, you can do that in the BSDs and other types of um, Unixes. So now we've talked about monitoring, we've talked about backup. Now let's talk a little bit about remote administration. I'll start with console access because I find that this is a really interesting thing to start working on. So you've got console access and you see console access ports on a lot of stuff these days. You see them on your traditional routers and switches, load balancers, and now you also see them on UPSs um, and other um, interesting devices. Um, you should aggravate your console connections to a terminal server. You can use a hardware terminal server that with a serial or network interface to a PC that maintains access. Uh, Conserve is a great freeware product that allows you to manage um, console connections on a Linux host um, and using like um, Zyclades or Cisco's or um, um, Lightwaves or all kinds of cool uh, terminal servers out there that give you access to those hosts. Um, and some of those newer terminal servers actually support direct network connections via SSH using radius uh, support and IP filtering pretty darn cool. A lot of, often a lot of those use um, embedded Linux, um, uh, which is um, a neat feature. You can also connect out of band via dial-up modem with a callback feature. So for example, if the network dies completely, well, guess what? You're not connecting via SSH to your console server anymore. So, well, I can actually you know, call into that modem and have it call me back so I can find out what's going on um, and initiate a console connection to my upstream router to find out why the network is down. It saves me a lot of time. So there's advantages. You can also log console messages to a terminal server. Um, when I was administering um, a bunch of Solaris boxes, usually the most interesting messages were the ones that flew across the console after syslog had died. Um, 
guess what? If I'm just using a traditional syslog server, I'm not gonna catch that. So it's often great to have console messages being logged to a terminal server. You can also use it as a central point of authentication into the console management. And it provides the ability to turn off uh, Telnet and other administrative clear text protocols on a network segment. There are still a lot of uh, network devices out there that only allow Telnet. Well, guess what? You can turn off Telnet now and connect via uh, via the console server over an SSH connection to the console server instead. If SSH or administrative interfaces fail to respond, the administrator can connect directly to the console without physically going to the DMZ. One of my favorite war stories for that was um, people who follow FreeBSD um, and the, uh, the current branch, um, there was a bug in one of the commits to SSHD. Um, and so all these administrators blindly upgraded their systems, uh, patched their SSHD, and the SSHD didn't restart. And they, most of these servers were in co-location facilities, you know, anywhere from 10 miles to 200 to 2,000 miles away. Oh, crap. So what, what they had to do is they had to spend an entire weekend, you know, driving over to the co-location facility, restoring their SSH daemon and restarting it so they can administer the boxes again. Well, guess what? If you use a console server, you've got another ways of, a means of access. There's some disadvantages. You gotta deal with a break problem, in particular in Solaris host. Um, if you disconnect a console, as I'm sure a lot of you have found, uh, that goes into boot prom mode. Um, most ter modern day terminal servers will deal with this properly and can, can keep the proper connection um, even after you've changed focus from the console server from between one sun host to another. Um, you've got additional hardware and cabling that you have to do. I've seen really bad terminal server um, uh, implementations where you've got all these cables just flying everywhere. And so you've got seven cables coming out of every host. Um, it's really ugly. So you have to make sure that you have proper cable management discipline before you, you go into that. Um, You've got to have authentication and logging for console use um, once the user has access to the terminal server, which is difficult to implement uh, with a hardware device. These, a lot of these um, devices are great at maintaining authentication, but they're not very great at, at logging uh, access. Another common uh, f uh, form of implementation that I've seen is actually SSH bastion gateways. It's one hardened point of entry into SS via SSH to the other host. Uh, you see that, in, for example, in this network design. You can use an SSH agent to elim eliminate interactivity on the gateway when maintaining a single host that can SSH the endpoints. So you can put really lock down the SSH daemon on the host um, without uh, compromising your ability to, to maintain those boxes. You should always use our RSA identity files, never use just plain old passwords. Um, you should disable our, our host authentication and root login. Always have your users log in with a unique uh, username and then su to root or sudo. You should bind SSH only to the admin LAN interfaces. Oftentimes when I do audits to networks, I see them do everything right except that they just bind SSH D to 0.0.0.0 so that they're listening on SSH on every, on every interface that's installed on the box. Um, they should only bind it to the admin LAN. Watch your patch levels. SSH, of course, is a very popular target. Well, also there's, don't, not to think that I'm Unix-centric, there's also the Windows problem. So you've got two popular options with Windows GUI, um, PC Anywhere um, and Windows Terminal Servers. You see PC Anywhere often running with Windows NT4 and Windows Terminal Services running with uh, 2000. So there's a lot of risks uh, presented with PC Anywhere. It runs on a well-known port. Uh, you got previous versions that have been vulnerable to denial service attacks and weak password encryption. And the typical configuration, and you can't change this in the GUI, um, binds to all interfaces so that anyone who can, can, can bypass your router and firewall and initiate a, uh, a, a PC Anywhere connection uh, will be able to do so on the untrusted interface. And you should avoid expo exposing it on the untrusted network segment. Um, and of course, the tr typical configuration out of the box, PC Anywhere actually bypasses the Windows login mechanism. So what do I mean by that? So administrator A logs in um, to PC Anywhere. He hits his control alt delete, logs into the box, and then does his work and then unconnect and disconnects. 
leaving himself logged in. Administrator B comes in, doesn't like Administrator A too much, dissed dis his coding skills, logs in uh, to PC Anywhere and says, oh, guess what? Administrator A is still logged in. What kinds of things can I screw up for him today? Um, so you don't have any way of actually controlling uh, the, the login mechanism. You can configure PC Anywhere to uh, automatically log out a user when they, uh, when they get disconnect via PC Anywhere, um, and that should be the way that it's configured. You should also make a, a use of the allowed IP addresses f feature so that you can limit admin host. You should also enable TCP IP host bind mode to only list it on administrative interface. So this is the way to do it. And um, I have a link here that you guys can copy down. I'm sorry, this wasn't in your slides. Um, I forgot to add that. Um, this is a link to the semantic knowledge base article. Um, you actually have to change the registry in order to um, add to, to only have it bind to certain interfaces. You need to, if, you, if you're paranoid, you should change the default port of PC Anywhere. You should always make the, the sure that the user's logged off after session disconnect. You should enable event logging and session recording if, if uh, disk space permits. One of the cool things that PC Anywhere does provide you is the ability to record the GUI session. So sometimes I've had to allow less than trustworthy vendors to connect to my host uh, via PC Anywhere, and I don't trust what they do. And so if I'm not around to watch them, I can record the host, what they have done from every mouse click and review those later on. So if you can, if you have the disk space, Go ahead and record that. Um, you, you can utilize symmetric and encryption and deny lower level. Um, you can actually use X509 for host authentication if you want to. Um, you could, should be able to disable res the response to PC Anywhere query broadcast um, so that, it, for example, I don't know if any of you have been on a cable modem or something like that um, or a DSL line and all of a sudden you see a PC and you're running an IDS and all of a sudden you see all these PC Anywhere probes. That's the default behavior when you bring up a PC Anywhere client. It actually does a UDP port probe of every host on its, seg on its segment in order to uh, determine which PC Anywhere hosts are out there. Well, you can actually disable your servers if you are actually running PC Anywhere to um, to not respond to those probes. You can configure your clients to only use TCP to connect rather than a UDP query to initiate the connection, which reduces your firewall rule set. The more UDP I can eliminate out of my firewall rule sets, the happier I am. Separate a uh, user account for each admin with strong passwords, so you shouldn't have a shared administrator um, a PC Anywhere account, for example. Um, and you should limit your login attempts. Um, you know, don't allow someone to try and brute force it. And you should all only use PC Anywhere user with PC Anywhere privilege. So, for example, you've got you can actually integrate Windows authentication into PC Anywhere. Um, I I wouldn't recommend it. So then you've got the Windows GUI. You know, with terminal service services. It utilizes a, the Windows authentication mechanism. It runs on a well-known port, and again, you should avoid exposing it on an untrusted network segment. Um, I'm gonna talk just briefly about how to secure Windows terminal service for administrative use. You can also, of course, use Windows terminal service that is for application deployment. I'm not gonna talk about that here. Um, you should only bind it to the administrative segment interface, and that's actually doable within the man, uh, Microsoft Management Control Console, so that's a lot easier to do. You should also force all configuration parameters at the server level. For some reason, Windows Terminal Server will allow the client to override certain security sys uh, 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 parameters um, when it connects, unless you actually set that checkbox. You should use a separate Windows Terminal Server login from your Windows login and give each administrator a unique login with a strong password. That way, of course, your, your users should not be using their administrator passwords uh, to do their day-to-day -day work, and you also need to be able to audit the work that they do. Um, you should take the administrator's group out of the connection permissions. By default, anyone in the administrator group can connect to the Windows terminal server. So you need to take that group out, create your own group, and add individual users that you want to connect in. Um, in enable auditing. Remove the TS Internet user account, which is actually installed by default um, for no good reason. Uh, 
utilize high encryption for RDP. RDP is a protocol that runs on Windows terminal services and disconnect idle and broken connections aggressively. There have been some uh, known exploits of actually hijacking jacking, uh, Windows terminal sessions that were not, uh, that were broken abnormally. And if you're paranoid, you can change the Windows terminal services port. So finally, I want to talk about log solutions. All kinds of logs out there. There's your traditional syslog, uh, where you have uh, Unix and network devices that either write to the local file system or send uh, information over the uh, over the network over UDP port 514. Um, you've got your Windows NT 2000 event logs that write to the local file system. Um, however, there is network support for syslog available um, for third parties. And then there's application and service log files that you can use a variety of different uh, forms. Syslog, Windows NT event log, flat files, binary files, or database entry. So you got all these different disparate types of logs. What's the management need? Well, the management need is to centralize those logs for analysis. So let's first focus on network syslog. So if possible, you should uh, limit which host um, can send log entries to a host. Heartbeat creation and detection is absolutely imperative for, um, for centralization. I get a lot of people who tell me, so what's the point? You know, if I centralize the log, the first thing the attacker is going to do when he gets under the host, he's going to kill the syslog D process, and then no, I'm not going to get any more information. Well, guess what? Someone killing syslog D is an event that you should know about. And so you need to set up heartbeat monitoring. So the syslog just goes every minute, every 30 seconds to the syslog server, a, a log event, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then when it stops saying I'm here, you've got a problem. Um, Flood detection is also imperative. So if you've got a situation where I, another common criticism I see of, of, of log centralization over network syslog is, well, they'll just flood my log. You know, they'll, they'll send a bunch of crap to my port. Oh, guess what? That's a security incident as well. If, if you're not logging for a certain, if you're not watching your logs for a certain number of log entries per second, then you're not really watching your logs. You've got to make sure that you you contend for those possibilities. Um, system, syslog server should sit on administrative lag, lands whenever possible. Make sure that clients are sending messages over the administrative LAN interface, not over the untrusted interface. And there are initiatives out there for secure syslog, but they're not even close to implementation yet, uh, going through the traditional IETF shuffle. Um, you've got log signing, you've got encrypted transfer, um, and in, um, prevention of insertion deletion attacks. You should take a look at the working group for syslog uh, and uh, see what's out there and see what people are thinking. Believe it or not, there's still not a standard RFC for syslog implementation, even though it was one of the first um, uh, protocols and uh, services running on Unix. And they're finally trying to rectify that now. Um, take a look at Syslog NG. There's actually a bunch of other new next generation Syslog uh, programs that have been popping up lately. I haven't had a chance to take a look at some of the newer ones, but uh, Syslog NG is the one that I always use. It gives you the ability to sort by host, um, to use regular expressions to, to um, actually define uh, log files. So you can say, I want to put all log files from X host of IIS server logs of type 505 um, in this file. It gives you that level of granularity, which is pretty darn cool. So then you've got your NT and 2000 event logs. You need to get those logs off the server as quickly as possible. There's two major options for this. You can use agent-based forwarding, such as there are syslog daemons out there um, for, uh, for Windows NT and uh, Windows 2000. Um, Sabernet, uh, .NET has a free implementation of syslog daemon for Windows NT. Um, there's also a very nice uh, shareware version um, of Event Reporter at www.eventreporter.com um, that has a really good daemon that works well that I often use in NT deployments. There's also commercial solutions, you know, such as the OpenView agents and other uh, compact uh, insight agent, all those types of things. Um, you got batch retrieval um, where you can use common resource kit utilities to pull a log. Um, out, of, by, out of there, either by binary uh, format or by text format, such as dump EL and the resource kit utility. You gotta ask yourself the question, are you gonna be pushing or pulling those logs? And if the log is cleared by the intruder, again, you better know about it. You might wanna use a Perl script on the local 
on, on your local NT box is just to check every once in a while for event ID 517, which is event log cleared. Um, you can use the active state um, event uh, parole with uh, the event uh, log module that's available. There's um, there's a lot more information about uh, Windows NT event logging and integration with syslog. You can take a look at my SANS NETSEC uh, 2000 presentation for many more details. If you go to www.securify slash labs, uh, you can download that presentation. Then you've got your flat file logs. Well, you could always syslog them, I guess. You could tail off them, <laughs> pipe them to logger if you want. Probably not the best solution. Um, you need to get them off the originator as, as soon as possible. If they're too big or cumbersome, like for example, web access files, things like that, go ahead and, and cull them during the push or pull process on the host themselves, rather than waiting until they get to the centralization host. So if you've got a bunch of crap in the log that you don't care about, um, get rid of it at the, get it rid of it um, at the agent. Don't, don't wait until it gets to the centralization point. Um, how often to push or pull? You gotta kind of play a little war game with yourself. It's like examine the criticality of when the of the logs and then allocate and then analyze the worst case scenario. Someone blows away your log file and you've got to recreate what happened. How far back do you want to have your log files? Is it a minute? that you get a new log file every minute? Is it every hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? What is it? And if the log disappears, you better know about it. There was, some neat, uh, there was a neat presentation like yesterday uh, by the authors of uh, Fenord, which I, I guess isn't available yet, um, but they, could have, they talked about running processes in the background that were completely hidden, uh, uh, and you could have a, something that checks to make sure the log file doesn't get blown away, um, or that an intruder doesn't actually, isn't able to uh, change the log file at all, or even though it looks like they are by using a, a kernel uh, module. So you, overall, you want to look out for um, administrative interfaces, such as um, you know, the cold fusion, uh, you know, administrator login, which I see. Um, another one that I've seen a lot lately, actually, when doing pen tests, is um, Tomcat. Uh, Tomcat has an admin servlet that's installed by default, um, and if you um, install Tomcat and don't disable the context of that admin servlet, um, attackers can go to there and deregister the context of your entire uh, server or remap the contents to the root file system and then browse the root file system from there. Um, you need to follow best practices in particular in regards to resource utilization, making sure that you're not throwing too much on the pipe, segmenting your pipes so that you can easily um, look at what's going on in on your network and, and actually be able to use your snort, use your Argus, use your TCP dump in a, in, a, in a strong way. Make sure that your system management protocols use authentication and question the integrity of the data that those, those uh, systems are providing for you. Um, so with that, uh, that's, that's my presentation. Uh, and if you've got questions, go ahead. Yes, actually, I, um, I recently performed a penetration test breaking into a Citrix I, 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 ICA uh, host from the, uh, from the remote. The encryption uh, has been improved dramatically. Um, unfortunately, being able to lock down uh, Citrix hosts to not allow access to the command prompt um, is actually quite difficult. Um, so that's, that's my concern on there. It's not so much the encryption protocol, but actually control the OS uh, once Citrix is installed. Go ahead. So there's, there, this is one of the greatest debates of all time uh, between network engineers and uh, security engineers. Uh, network engineers think VLANs are the future of the world, and you're seeing like these big CAT 6000 switches with actual using complete VLANs with a route switch modules built into the switch, um, using VLANs to do all the segmentation. Um, there have been known exploits of jumping VLANs, um, particularly at broadcast addresses. Uh, VLANs are not by their, by their fault designed for security, they're designed for, for aggrega aggregation, uh, they're designed for convenience. Um, when you build, a, when you use a switch or you use a hub, you're trying to create points of aggregation into the network. 
it is not a device that is used for segmentation of the network, as routers, firewalls, those types of devices are used for segmentation. So you use the intended tools the way that they're intended to use. Hmm, I guess I probably put myself on one side of the debate there. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, I haven't really looked into those solutions very well, and um, there, I haven't really seen a solution that I've liked. Um, but uh, as far as console access, um, there are ways, uh, I've seen some interesting hacks uh, where people have uh, bound command shells to serial ports um, on Windows NT in 2000 and, and hooked them up actually to uh, modems uh, to to have kind of the last resort connection, which is similar to the lights out type of connection. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really taken a look at how, how the security impl implications of that are. Other questions? Yeah. What was your address for the next Oh, um, www.securify.com slash labs. I've seen that, actually. I've seen uh, people run SNMP and maybe one other thing, like maybe backup um, on, the, on that. Um, you gotta ask yourself, why are you doing it? If you're doing it for security, more power to you, um, although it is, it is oftentimes uh, an additional deployment. But if you're doing it because there's so much SNMP traffic that it needs its own dedicated segment, then you're, you have oftentimes have other network engineering problems. So it, it just depends. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. I've been trying to convince our network admins that VLANs are not the way to go. <laughs>